and gives us thinner cuts, so we have more spatial resolution with a CT compared to an MR, where you get more of a staircasing artifact as you begin to stack, stack thicker cuts of myocardium. And so from the CT, uh, you get wall thinning and hypoattenuation and calcification that can be indicative of arrhythmogenic substrates. Uh, from MRI, you get just the late gadolinium enhancement with this, as you know, the orange and yellow areas indicating dense and less dense scar. Um, and you know the MRI with the late enhancement again, looking at the signal intensity gives us that that sense of of, of scarring. But this is you know, this is not um, easily done, and certainly this is a, in a research protocol. It's, it looks great, but in the real world, much more challenging. And so, I think the multi-parametric imaging available from CT is particularly helpful. You can see the wall thinning, you can see fat uh, and calcification, um, and uh, it correlates you know, off very nicely with late iodine enhancement uh, that is, is similar to what we use as late gadolinium enhancement in MRI. And we're now at a point where not, we don't just get late iodine enhancement, we get dense scar and less dense scar. The same concept of late gadolinium enhancement, we see this distribution of signal intensity. The group uh, in Bordeaux is now able to provide the same information to us. Um, and th so from this, um, we get the late iodine, we get the arterial phase with the wall thinning, and the wall thinning is, is, is again, a surrogate for star density, um, and it's, it's very similar to what we would see on an MR. So this is the same part, star CT, MRI, and the scar looks very similar, and then you can look at the late, get, late iodine enhancement with dense and less dense scar, and it, again, the distribution looks very similar. So. I have a lot of confidence in this, and this is um, moving on to a case with substrate re uh, registration. This is a post MIVT uh, inferior wall MI. Um, we're going to be doing a patient uh, almost identical to this later today um, with uh, this backside scar. Here's your wall thickness. Um, the dark brown areas are less than one millimeter thick. See this little bridge here. This is in cell trouble, and you can imagine there's perhaps a conduction channel through here. Um, CT fat. Um, this is often uh, a predictor of a difficult ablation. Um, uh, I think Frank Bogan and uh, Hubert Cochet had a nice paper describing this just very recently. Uh, CT iodine imaging uh, showing dense scar and gray zone, and often there's uh, some discordance between wall thinning and uh, and late iodine, and that can also be uh, concerning, and it's almost identical to MR, but the topology of this car, perhaps you get a better sense of it, at least in this image from this wall thickness, okay? All right, so um, this is one of, you know, an index case, um, associate reg registration and ischemic with high density mapping. This is somebody who had an inferior wall MI, prior cabbage, um, ejection fraction in the 40% range, um, and certainly somebody that we think would benefit from ablation compared to amiodarone when the ejection fraction tends to be better. Um, they had a VT arrest uh, with secondary prevention ICD implants, um, had been managed with soda wall. Uh, and that after some uh, discussion, the, the, the perception was that amiodarone was not, um, would not be a better option than an ablation. So we went forward with that. Again, use this multipolar mapping approach with, with the grid catheter, seeing these, these uh, these different potentials. Here's our, our inferior star. Um, I have a CS catheter up here. A, there's an atrial signal. Your ECG leads up on top. Far field ventricular signals. Here's all of our grid signals. Um, and you see these very nice late signals. Um, and our setup uh, in our lab is to look between and across every spline. So that's why you see all that data there. And we're annotating the latest late. Um, the way the system works is you can look, you can set it up to look just down the splines or you can look between and across splines. This is what the scar looked like um, with what was called the non-way. So we're looking just down the splines uh, and we have some, uh, some dense scar here uh, in this area of preserved voltage and we fuse it with the in-heart CT and we see this kind of, uh, this is three and five millimeter wall thickness. We see this little channel here um, and it, makes us wonder, is this an area of interest? But we don't really see a bridge uh, that easily. Maybe it's a registration error. Certainly the map may not be complete. And there are, there's always issues. I, I, I'll be the first to say, 
uh, that contact is incredibly important and often very difficult with multi-port catheters. It's a point um, that I've, I've had discussions with uh, uh, with um, uh, Dr. Callens and uh, and others uh, at Penn at one point. Um, and um, if we look at the way then where we're now looking at the highest voltage potential recorded between or across lines, we see a bit of a different scar distribution now. Um, and it's this island of preserved voltage grows perhaps a little bit bigger. Uh, and maybe we're seeing a little bridge form there. Um, we register more. We've actually taken now a, a, a larger map, uh, got better contact, and it, it's kind of taking points that are interpolated and pushing them out a little bit. So I mean, look, it's a model, it's a simulated reality, but we're beginning to see this channel perhaps emerge with the wave approach versus the non-wave approach. Okay, um, you can see our ablation lesions uh, were fairly extensive. Um, I don't love this as early days of our group uh, using isochronal late activation mapping or ILAM for short. Um, it doesn't look as, uh, as well annotated as Rod's very beautiful maps. Um, but I, I think it makes a point that the colors are just different. Okay, so late potentials are mapped in blue and green and where we see the colors begin to come together, we think that's a slow conduction zone. Late is just late as Rod says, I love that phrase. Uh, but the distribution of these lights is somewhat different, I think. Uh, there's more blue and purple, certainly on the right, than there is on the left. And so <clears throat> the, uh, the mapping um, software, you know, depending on how we annotate those signals, will give us two very different maps, all right? And so, it, again, it leads me to this question of, of how can we use imaging uh, to better identify um, areas of interest because it's you know it's 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 really challenging there's so many variables to consider with how we map the, the catheters we use the density of mapping how many points we take which wave front um it's really challenging there's only so many hours in the day and there's cases to do so um you know we need to make it easier um and we're not there yet you know and i, I think i hope we, we generate a lot of discussion from this talk and, and certainly uh, stimulate you know more research um, so can we use imaging to discriminate substrates? And this is a patient um, from Florida, had lots of kids, had no familial history of heart disease, had cardiac arrest, um, went uh, to the hospital with palpitations and was found to be EDT, had the, the, you know, the normal workup for anybody with a wide complex tachycardia in any hospital where they get the cath and don't find coronary disease, they have a necco and it shows a big and large right ventricle, but the LV looks fine. Um, has a dilated right ventricle on the MR with some wall motion abnormality. And the LV is a little bit big, but um, otherwise normal. Has this ECG, they got an ICD for secondary prevention, it's atrially paced, and you see this uh, uh, very nice uh, epsilon wave, these T wave inversions, and, and certainly with the imaging and that ECG, you would think of ARVD, um, you know, not hard, has this VT, which is really, an unusual left bundle morphology DT. So we think slam dunk, like why are we even talking about this guy, you know, in imaging, like we know the diagnosis on clinical grounds, right? That's what the, the task force criteria exists for. So who cares? Um, but, you know, you got this funny VT and, you know, we're, we're always worried. I mean, I always worry about RV VTs. I, I just don't always know. And, and this was a point driven home to me by really my mentors, Dr. Tedrow and Dr. Stevenson, who really, you know, kind of struggled with this and published very, you know, this really nice paper in 06 with Bruce Copeland showing uh, scar mediated RV origin tachycardias can look similar. Um, this is an idiopathic VT, those aren't hard, you know, the RV is normal and you see all this pink normal voltage stuff, but then you have ARVD and sarcoid and there's a lot of scar there. And to me at least, I can't look at one and say that's ARVD and that's sarcoid, I would say, it's an arrhythmogenic right ventricle, and it could be genetic, it could be inflammatory, I just don't know. Um, and then there's the repair test. That's easy because, you know, although I guess they could have sarcoid, they certainly have a surgical history that we're gonna know about, okay? But there's, there's certainly um, a lot of different ways uh, to slice and dice the right ventricle, and can we use imaging to better discern the arrhythmogenic potentials uh, or the arrhythmogenic ryth areas? And so, this is the ablation. This is a, a very similar to where we ablated uh, the, the gentleman with ARVD last week, kind of here on this lateral tricuspid valve, some dense scar here. This is always a difficult area to get contact in. This is the back side of the tricuspid valve ablated there. Went great, feel good, everybody high fives and says, okay, we're done. You know, not inducible. 
so what next? Do we discharge, you know, on antiarrhythmics? Um, is there any further evaluation of the cardiomyopathy? I mean, again, I think there's these lingering questions, you know, do we genetically test? Um, we looked at the family history and there's nobody with uh, uh, rhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. There's a, a, a uh, however, um, a family member who had sarcoid, and there are down here in South Carolina, here in the sarcoid belt, you know, we, we have not identified a, a genetic susceptibility gene uh, or, or, or locus, uh, but it, gosh, you know, there can be familial clusters. And so maybe, and certainly um, there is uh, you know, a prior description, again, by Bill Stevenson and Bruce Copeland of sarcoid mimics of ARVD. This was work done at the Brigham. Um, uh, when I was a first-year cardiology fellow, a uh, uh, 33-year-old guy uh, who had ARVD and intractable arrhythmias ultimately underwent transplant. And it wasn't until after the heart was trans explanted that they said, oh my gosh, there's granulomas here. This isn't ARVD at all. Um, but that map sure looks, you know, pretty impressive. And sarcoid VT certainly can look like any other VT from uh, an arrhythmogenic right ventricle, these weird left bundle VTs. And I think most of the VT crowd understands this. Um, and so, you know, we've got a more advanced imaging here, not a CTR and MR this time. This is a PET scan, but I'll show you in a minute uh, a, a CT that was useful to detect um, sarcoid. Um, this is PET imaging, and it shows perfusion imaging and, and, uh, up on top, and FDG uptake on the bottom. And you see this perfusion defect here on the septum, and then you see this dark area down here on the mid to basal and pure septum with FDG uptake, and that's consistent with or suggested certainly a sarcoid. And in this case, biopsy and voila, here are these nice uh, uh, granulomatous uh, uh, findings um, uh, consistent with, uh, with, with, with sarcoid. Um, and so we got lucky, but can we use better imaging to identify these people? And it's really hard. Sarcoid is, is really challenging. It can look like whatever it wants, at least on MR. These are all patients with, uh, uh, with, with uh, sarcoid and it can look Transmural, like an infarct other, there's this funny scar here. There's this mid myocardial stuff. Here's some RV stuff and some basal inferior uh, subepicardial LV stuff, and then this sort of patchy stuff in the LV. But it can it can certainly mimic at least up here in patient A uh, uh, an ischemic patient. So what about CT imaging? Um, this is a patient that was sent to me. He was post cabbage. Uh, labeled in ischemic, his EF was in the 35 to 40% range, um, had a known CERT territory infarct, um, had been bypassed. Um, it was kind of a weird bypass. It was uh, a single vessel bypass with a vein graft uh, to an OM, but that's what they did. Uh, and um, had VT, and we said, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's worrisome a little bit, but sometimes those VTs um, along the mitral valve can can be epicardial and you know could be challenging. We're going to image this guy beforehand. Get the board OCT, and we do see some wall thinning um, here in the basal lateral LV. But what we also found was some late iodine enhancement here in the basal septum. I said, "Oh, that's that's interesting. Um, that's very strange." But you know, we had not seen the actual VT. We take them to the lab and we induce VT from the LV summit area, right in this area up here of the LV osteum. And I thought that's very strange but not so strange because there's late enhancement there. So you know, maybe this isn't ischemic at all. It's a, you know, the guy has coronary disease has been bypassed, but that has nothing to do with the disease. And so we petted him in the hospital after the VT ablation, sent it off to the Bordeaux guys. They said, yeah, look at this. There's this, uh, this here's the, the FDG uptake that correlates very nicely with the wall thinning and the late iodine. We thought, wow, that's really, that's pretty cool. Um, we put him on uh, medical therapy. He's, he's pulsed with steroids and started on methotrexate. Um, he's come back now once. We had to ablate him again from up here and actually had to ablate uh, via the epicardial coronary vein and uh, with high power half normal saline. Thanks, Will Sauer, for the half normal trick. Um, we ablated there and that took care of the problem. Um, so here's another sarcoid patient now, you know, the multi-parametric modality is, is interesting. And it can, you know, this is the same patient, but seemingly distinct substrate. Okay. Um, this is somebody who had a, a biopsy confirmed sarcoid uh, based on a, a, a endobronchial biopsy and had a positive PET scan. And this um, 
uh, late uh, arterial phase um, uh, imaging, we had this you know, kind of patchy wall thinning here and the anterior and lateral wall. And here's your front nerve portion down here. You always see this wall thinning up by the mitral valve. It doesn't always mean anything. Uh, you just see wall thinning there for a variety of reasons. I think there's a Twitter thread that Will Sauer posted, I don't know, like two years ago about why that may happen. Um, and then you see this delayed iodine enhancement here um, that is uh, certainly showing a more dense scar uh, than what you're seeing just from the, 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 the wall thinning alone. We took the patient to the lab. The patient had been ablated uh, elsewhere. We find this endocardial scar, or the, I'm sorry, complete lack of endocardial scar. Here's our endocardial voltage map. Um, those orange, we, we draw our scar on ice. That orange line represents what I thought represented the scar area on the epicardium uh, on cardiosound. We drew that area uh, just to mark it for ourselves because we knew we were going to go up with cardio. We did, um, and we found uh, um, this DT. I don't love this. Uh, what do they call this map um, uh, from Cardo? The uh, I don't use it very often, but it's you sort of see this area of slow conduction through here, and you see this right here, right on top of that patchy area that kind of correlates with the wall thinning we saw on. Um, uh, on the on the arterial phase, so um, we were concerned though because the phrenic, of course, is our decanav sitting right underneath that. The registration uh, by our cardo uh, cast it was fantastic. We have a very talented cardo team here, um, and they uh, the fusion was excellent. And I I could not ablate here uh, without damaging the phrenic, so we we did insufflate um, uh, uh, the area. This is our, our patchy scar here. Here's our activation. It's almost sort of focal through there. Um, and so we insufflated the epicardium with, uh, with about 300 cc's of half normal uh, saline. Uh, we did not have a balloon available. Unfortunately, it worked. It doesn't always work um, to do it that way. The balloon is actually probably better, at least in our experience. But um, in, this, in this case, we used a, a, a fluid we pushed the phrenic out of the way, we ablated there and terminated the DT. Um, and so the Bordeaux imaging really was relevant. And here you see that uh, the, the coronary vessels and we were kind of right in this little gap here, we thought that we were safe. Okay. So, um, you know, the imaging really can be helpful, we think. I mean, I know these arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies are challenging. Um, there can be a lot of overlap at the histological level, at the clinical level, at the genetic level, and we really hopefully can uh, perhaps refine our use of imaging. And um, I know Dr. Tedro and I have talked about looking at some of the genetic myopathies with our with our imaging databases. Um, and so in conclusion, um, you know, using imaging, can we use it to define substrate beforehand? Can we assess scar locations? Um, I like it more and more to plan our attack. Um, and I think there will be more data emerging about this. Um, can we use it for risk stratification for VT, for predicting arrhythmogenesis? Um, and certainly the heterogeneity of SCAR by CT or MR could be a compelling way to at least predict the rhythmogenicity. Can we use it during ablation um, to enhance our definition of SCAR and anatomy and to navigate and avoid uh, the coronaries in the front of Okay. So that's all I have. Um, you know, thanks very much for your attention. It's really been an honor. And Nishant uh, and really the whole group in Chicago really got this going as a local set of discussions amongst the, uh, the really amazing EP groups in Chicago um, and making it now, I think, a, a global phenomenon. Thanks to, uh, thanks to you, especially a, a special shout out to Nishan for really making this happen and uh, coordinating all of this. So thank you very much. And this is close to my home. So um, you're welcome to visit anytime and fellows who wanna come down and work with us, um, please come. Thanks so much. All right, thanks. Jeff, uh, a few questions that have come through. It looks like you're, are you routinely using the music software or is that just part of a research protocol? Is that your standard workflow at this point? Um, we do have an IRB for it. Um, we have a research database, both a retrospective and now a prospective database. And um, we use it in most instances. We don't use it all the time. Uh, we are using our own independent funding to cover it because it's not commercially available uh, right now, though I think they're exploring that. Um, and so, you know, I know the centers that are participating in this are, are independently funded to participate. It had been covered, I know, for a while by, um, uh, you know, grants from the French government to the, the Bordeaux team at Lyric. Um, 
uh, but now we're using um, our own funding. And so I'm not actually sure aware of the status. I know uh, I've been hearing some rumors of uh, getting FDA approval uh, for this, but you know, I, I want to be very clear, it's, it's completely off label. There's no uh, you know, service to uh, available yet, but we, you know, we certainly hope, and I have no financial interest or stake in it, by the way, I want to be very clear about that too. So thanks. Uh, yeah, Paul Zai just um, chatted or texted me saying that music is going to go commercial for whatever that's worth. Um, and then, so I guess the the other questions are related to, you know, if you don't have access to that software at this point, what would you consider your essential pre and interprocedural imaging tests that should be had in every case? Well, Echo first, right? Um, you know, and Echo is 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 easily available. It's it's Almost every patient has one. And it's also a safety issue. Um, patients that are sent to us for VT ablation, particularly ischemics, um, or those with, with uh, you know, really very severe TCM, I'm always concerned about thrombus. Um, and so uh, uh, a contrast uh, echo is, uh, is certainly helpful. And it, it also allows you to see uh, wall motion abnormalities that um, you know, at least points you in the direction of where you might want to go um, uh, to, to you know, target your mapping. I know when we create these, these, these three-dimensional electroanatomic maps with whatever mapping system we use, it doesn't really matter. You know, we want to create, I mean, at least me, I like to see the whole chamber just because I'm, it's really hard for me to navigate unless I see the whole chamber. Um, and it's just easier for me to get a, a three-dimensional sense from that. It doesn't mean you map it with the same intensity in all areas. It just means that you can refine, you know, with, some uh, better assessment of scar location, then you can really target your, your fine mapping, if you will, to those areas. Um, and so echo first. If you can get a CT, um, you know, the late iodine enhancement is really a special protocol. I'm happy to put people in touch with our group here. I know the Brigham does it extremely well too. Um, amongst the, at least as of last year, I was, in a, I was visiting Bordeaux and I was told by Hubert Couchet that only about three centers in the world at least at that time we're really doing um, high quality late iodine enhancement. Our group was one of them. Uh, and that's really radiology driven. That's not something that an EP can drive. But there's ways of doing that. And I'm, again, I'm happy to facilitate discussions. I suspect Dr. Tedro would be how to would, would, would do that. Um, and um, I know the Michigan group does it well as, uh, in addition. MRI, you know, look, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to get MRIs, you know, in patients that are sick VT patients transferred in, you know, in a timely fashion before VT ablation, um, it's it's generally a challenge. And our MR quality is is so so. Um, we have not done a great job with the, the lead and can artifacts that can alter your uh, your ability to to perform fine fine imaging of scar. Um, and um, you know, the other issue is just one of staircasing. You, you have thicker slices of myocardium uh, with MR compared to CT. So when you, you try to integrate an image that's already somewhat adulterated by uh, the, the artifacts from the can and the lead, it, it just becomes a, a more difficult registration. Uh, th that's just our experience, though. And then I guess along those lines, there's a question about using ICE routinely in every VT case, and do you use the images that you get from ICE to help guide your mapping? We do. So we do. And actually, Mike Field and I just wrote a paper about ICE imaging and VT ablation. Um, and uh, we use ICE for every VT um, for a variety of reasons. We use it to, for transeptal. If we go transeptal, we use it to visualize catheter location. We use it to visualize ablation and lesion formation. We use it uh, to visualize endocavitary structures like the papillary muscles. Um, and we use it to identify scar. And you can see, um, you know, areas of increased echogenicity. Uh, I sent a picture of a difficult VT using this, an inferior ischemic with a pat muscle. The Penn Group published a very nice paper showing uh, the sort of pat concealment, if you will, of critical elements of, of VT and those inferior scars. Um, recently, and I sent a picture of one to, to Dave Callen, who wrote that paper. And it's really, I mean, you, you can sometimes see these little areas. It's just, it's, it's just where you, you just can't go. And so ICE, I think, is indispensable um, for visualizing uh, those scars. Absolutely. Um, 
sorry. So there's one that just came through here. So a patient with a normal EF with VT, I guess, uh, would you recommend performing cardiac MR or some other advanced imaging as opposed to just labeling it idiopathic VT? I, I'm always suspicious. I mean, I think, um, yeah, there was a paper a few years back uh, by, I think it was Antonio Corrado, uh, was, is from one of the biggest science centers looking at patients with ostensibly normal hearts. Um, and finding, um, I think these were an elite athletes in Italy, um, that there was actually a, a surprising, uh, very small, but you know, subset of folks that had these inflammatory myocardi myocarditis, these sort of lymphocytic myocarditis uh, that affected the RV. And I, I do like to, if, if, if they're young enough, um, I'm always suspicious. Uh, you know, one patient comes to mind, it was a woman sent to me, he was actually a former professional tennis player in her early 30s, but a professional tennis player who was at that point, I think a professional at like a club somewhere you know, down here in the, you know, in the Southeast and um, developed a rapid tachycardia. Um, didn't faint, she's an incredibly fit woman um, and the heart rate is about 220 beats per minute. EMS came, they got a, a, a wonderful 12 lead ECG of it in the field. Um, transported her, um, they shocked her en route. Uh, I'm not sure why she was stable, but um, it looked like a, it, you know, just a classic RBO TVT. Uh, they took her to the lab uh, at this other center um, and they failed an ablation. They sent her to us, you know, for thought, you know, possibly an epicardial dough. We took her, we took her for imaging and she had, um, you know, lone beals. She actually had ARVD. Um, that had been undiagnosed, and she was, you know, there's no family history. Um, we did pat her too, uh, you know, I showed that that overlap, um, so we did pat that patient as well. But, um, yeah, I tend to, I do, I do utilize MR in, in many instances, probably more than I don't, probably, I would say, 70 80 percent of the time. Um, you know, if the ECG is at a, it, the guidelines for that are if the RV is enlarged on an echo, I'll do it. If the ECG shows any abnormalities, uh, repolarization abnormalities in particular, I'll do it. If there's any evidence of a conduction delay, I'll do it. Um, and that's, you know, that's, um, those are the usual guide, guidelines I use for, for more advanced imaging. Okay, great. Uh, if there are any other questions or comments, people can unmute themselves. Otherwise, as Jeff said, there's only limited hours and lots of cases to do. I have a real quick question, Jeff. This is Brad. Hey, Brad. You talked a lot about MR and CT and ICE. I saw a case report the other day of a patient getting a, an ablation of an accessory pathway, and they merged the 3D echo with the Cardo map. Have you ever seen uh, 3D echo used as a imaging for VT or others? I haven't. I've wondered about it, but I have not seen it done. I, I, that <laughs> sounds really interesting. Um, I think, is there, one of the questions is, you know, what kind of software is out there? I'm sure there are people working on this, but you know, using um, ice, you can do a, you know, imagine a sweep of a chamber. It's difficult in the ventricle, um, you know, but sweeping the chamber and, and creating, you know, through some AI algorithm, right, you get the endocardial surface, the epicardial surface, and then everything in between, right? And you can, you know, this, the software can identify uh, based on signal intensity, you know, areas of, of, of scar. Um, that would be really a, 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 a interesting approach. I. I have not seen it, um, but I, I, I can imagine it coming in the next few years. Um, I'm not sure who's really leading the charge in ICE research. I don't know, Berman maybe, I don't know. Um, so that's really cool.